Good afternoon. Oh, okay, I'm gonna try that again. Let me do a little preference here. I'm from a call and response culture, so when I call out, I'm gonna look for you to respond. That lets me know that I'm not in this space alone. So good afternoon. Great. It also helps all of us better engage. I'm a former teacher turned attorney turned, I don't know what I do now. Um, And so I want us all to have an engaging conversation here. You are in the right place. If you are interested in designing an incredible client experience for your clients. Um, And I think some of us come to this space because we want to, at a minimum, avoid a bar complaint or a negative review. (laughs) I know I consult with a lot of attorneys who that's their question. How do I get them to not post these terrible things on social media about me? This is one way that you can do that. And I know that there are a number of you who are in this room because you genuinely also care about making sure that your clients have an empowering and positive experience with you. Uh, There's a great quote that's out there that says, you know, and I'm going to mess up the quote because I said it's a great quote. Uh, that people will remember, people don't often remember what you say or what you do, but they remember how you make them feel. And as someone who's practiced in an area where oftentimes the resolutions are less than fulfilling and wholesome and happy at times, I don't always get to say, yo, we won the case or we got this right answer and it feels great. But sometimes when I have to deliver bad news, the best way to be able to do that is making sure that my clients have had a very dignified experience And so that is a conversation that I'm extremely excited to have today with both Lolita and Daniela, um, who will be joining me for a conversation about the client experience. And you all are in for a treat because we have an actual, real, live client on this panel who's going to talk to us about what her experience was like engaging an attorney and going through a process Um, that many of us do routinely and don't necessarily always think about what it feels like to be someone new to the process or going through this sort of area in life. And so with that, I would love to turn it over to my incredible panelists here today and have each of them introduce themselves. We'll start with you, Daniela. Yep. So my name is Daniela Shari, and I am the lead special events manager at Clio. And my job specifically actually is um, organizing the Clio Cloud Conference. So I hope everyone's having a wonderful time and that we get to see you guys in Boston. And I am Lolita Rodovicha. I am a family law lawyer. I practice in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I started out as a criminal defense counsel, but I switched about 10 uh, years ago into family law. Wonderful. So we have here both a client and an attorney, and I like to start every great story where they begin at the beginning. Um, And so one of the things I really love about having observed both Daniela and Lolita as we were preparing for this is that they have actually formed a genuine friendship with each other, Uh, but it didn't start there. So I would love for you to tell us, to kind of walk us through how you found each other and we'll go on a journey of like how you got to the place where you are today. So who wants to start? Who wants to tell us? Maybe, Daniela, as a client, you can tell us how you found Lolita. Yeah, so um, I went through the unfortunate experience of going through a separation. And um, when this experience landed on my lap, I hopped on the Internet. I did some Google researching, called a couple of other lawyers. Didn't really feel like I was being heard on the other end. I felt like their initial response to me felt templated. And then I had expressed this frustration to a friend who was friends with Lolita and referred me to Lolita. And that same day, I think it may have been a weekend, Lolita called me immediately and I just felt an immediate connection, didn't know her at all, and that she expressed a lot of empathy. Um, And I wanted to respect her professionalism and not bother her on a weekend with what was developing in my life, but I immediately felt that empathetic connection. Yeah, and uh, I think it obviously helped a little bit that we had a mutual friend, and of course the mutual friend asked me to um, help her friend. Um, But after all of this ended, um, after the litigation came to an end, um, we uh, started to have a genuine friendship, and we've even um, gone on a few vacations together. I love that, and I want to be clear. Like Developing an incredible client experience doesn't mean that you have to be best friends with your client afterwards, but I think that's a really incredible aspect that these two met 
around a kind of tense, challenging experience in your life. And the process that you went through allowed you to end up on this end, actually genuinely liking each other, et cetera. But I'm not saying that that's the requirement or goal, uh, but I would love for you to talk to us from like a professionalism standpoint, Lolita, like when you got that call, what was your response? How did you go about creating what Daniela clearly sees was a very empathetic, untemplated, real, authentic experience? Well, I always start um, all, with all my clients uh, with the general meeting, um, intake questions, and asking them to tell me their entire story of what brings them here. Um, I don't mean from birth, but I mean from uh, what they perceive as the issue that they're looking to uh, get help with. Um, I ask them to provide me the full facts, as many facts as they can um, from the get-go, because I cannot give them advice um, as to what type of uh, eventual results they can expect if I don't have all of the facts. I tell them from the get-go, and this is probably a little bit of my um, cultural background. I was born in Eastern Europe, so I know that sometimes I'm a little bit blunt, um, or maybe a lot blunt, and I'm really honest. Um, so I set the expectations from the get-go that I am uh, going to be honest. I'll always tell you the truth um, as I see it. But I also need you to be honest with me. I need you to provide me as many facts as you have so that I can guide you. And then I also really find it important to give advice to the client to make the choice. It's not my choice to make. It's not for me to tell them what I think is best. I can tell them what my advice is as to what might get them to the result that they ultimately want. Um, but it's ultimately their decision on how to get there. So once I have all of the information and provide me as much information, for example, in, in Danielle's case, it was, you know, charts and Excel spreadsheets. That's fine. It's a lot of information. I'd rather have it from the get-go. I love that. I heard a couple of things there that I would love for us to maybe talk a little bit more about. Um, I think a couple of years ago, I gave a speech here talking about how we want to really make sure that we're working alongside of our clients and not on behalf of them. And that sometimes that mantra is like, I work on behalf of my client leads us to put our voice over theirs um, and substitute our principled professional opinion advice for the things that people might care about or might be really important for them. And sometimes we might downplay that in our haste to get the case move forward or meet filing deadlines, et cetera. It also sometimes has a show up as what we think an attorney should look like or be like. And one of the things that you said when you were thinking about engaging a client, when you spoke with Daniela first and foremost, was around your own cultural background and how you thought about that as it relates to like interacting with your clients. Um, did you feel, Daniela, that she was very blunt or off-putting or anything of that sort? Like, what did that translate to you? Um, well, I'm actually also from Eastern European descent, so her bluntness definitely was something I was familiar with. And um, I did really, I appreciated how direct Lolita is, but she always came across uh, with true, genuine kindness. While she's direct, which is what I actually appreciated more, uh, was that she was, it always came with like an underlying tone of genuine kindness. So it was easy to inter interact with her. Wonderful. And then also, I know from speaking with you, Alita, one of the things, and I heard you say it here, is that you wanted to make sure your clients were able to sort of make their own choices and that their voices and opinions were heard. How do you design for that? How do you make sure that that's something that every client gets to experience when they work with you? Well, as I said, I insist on all of the information um, and I insist on having the information from the get go. And if they don't give it to me right away, um, then I pester them for all of the information until I have it. And I tell them I cannot assist you until I have all of the information. Um, and uh, in addition, if something arises that was unexpected, um, I again, come back to the client to ask them to uh, brainstorm or provide as much information as they can as, uh, re surrounding that particular issue. And then I can make a roadmap as to the options for the client. So I can tell them, in my view, here's a multitude of options of how can we can react to something that has arisen. 
Um, now that you've provided me with this information and if I have all of the information, um, this is my advice. And I then let the client choose which option they go with. I can only tell them what I expect would occur in court um, with option one or option two. I'm not a mind reader. I don't have a crystal ball, of course. I can just give them my assessment of how it might play out. But ultimately, it's the client's decision on what it is and how it is that um, they choose to proceed. They can, and it also sometimes comes with costs, associated costs. If you choose option B, you know, um, full steam ahead, that might be costly to you, um, or it not might, it will be costly to you. Um, you might want to choose something more gentle, um, but it's ultimately the client's choice and they need to know what is involved in those choices. And with that being put to you, Daniela, as like, here are your choices, right? And we have a roadmap. Here are some things that might happen. How did that make you feel um, sort of having to provide a whole bunch of information and then getting back like, here are the options? I think that there might be a misconception on the client side that when you're facing a challenge um, and you, you know, hire a lawyer, that they're just going to take care of everything. And I learned very quickly that while Lolita is very talented and, and incredibly good at her job, I also had to be my own advocate in providing her with all of the information. And uh, I knew she couldn't fix all the problems, but she was very good at providing me with many options to consider. So I felt very empowered that every decision I made, I was getting back to what my ultimate goal was, which was peace at the end of this whole experience. So the options she gave me, I knew were actual fundamental steps in achieving that peace. Yeah. And what do you think helped you to be able to be the responsive type of client that Lolita would need to be able to deliver that service to you, to be able to give you those options, to be able to walk you through this process and help you understand and be a part of it? Lolita didn't just treat me like a client. She treated me like a human. And um, she, she treated me with a lot of respect that I was capable of also being her teammate in this process. I didn't feel like I was just a client paying her for her time. Uh, I very much felt like we were in university solving a problem together. So she, she made me feel like I was contributing. So I felt empowered to do what I do best, and that's gather information, be organized, be as communicative and thorough as possible as I do in my day job. And I just treated it just like a day job. Yeah. Were there ever moments in time where you, and both of you can answer this, where you like, were presented with something that you weren't con anticipating a challenge maybe arose, something that maybe felt less comfortable to share or disclose with your attorney or to have to share with your client. Uh, maybe you could talk us through how you all figured out how to navigate through those spaces that are potentially challenging or uncomfortable so that you could get to the place where you're really working alongside each other. I think um, Lolita being blunt and direct, really, this is where she really shines. When there were uncomfortable moments, uh, she was she was extremely professional. She just looked at the problem that was being presented to us. She provided options. She didn't pass judgment. Uh, and she said, okay, we're going to take care of this. And I felt as somebody that feels very self-sufficient and independent, she made me feel like I was being taken care of, even when moments were very uncomfortable. And, and just to uh, clarify, I didn't say that I'm going to take care of this. <laughs> um, uh, what I said was that I need uh, all of the information because we did have an, a number of uh, uh, times where something, uh, surpri a surprise occurred. Um, and once a surprise occurs, um, I need to come back to uh, Daniela and say, okay, um, I, again, I need to have all of the information. I didn't pass judgment. and But what I said was, no, no matter how uncomfortable it is, I need to know all of the facts. Otherwise, I cannot assist you in trying to figure out how we're going to um, navigate this, how we're going to get out of this problem, and how we're going to get you to your ultimate goal, which is peace. You came to me in turmoil. You asked me to get you out of turmoil. And there's a number of ways to get that. But ultimately, um, we both agreed that the number one goal is for her to have peace internally and also peace in her family life. Wonderful. 
I want to talk to um, turn to a bit of the kind of elephant that's in the room a lot of times when attorneys and clients are engaging. And depending on what your billing model is, um, this may become more or less of a source of tension. And so I want to talk a little bit about billing and fees and, and sort of how you have conversations about that. Because we know when clients engage attorneys, a lot of times they're perhaps might be reluctant to do that because there's not a lot of fee certainty. I don't know how much this is going to cost. You were going through a separation um, that has a lot of other aspects to it that can be financial as well as now having to take on the cost of hiring legal representation to assist you. So what were your conversations together about fees and what this would cost, uh, what the investment would be in to arrive at peace? Well, I can start. I mean, from the get-go, I tell my client this is going to be hourly. Uh, And from the get-go, I advise that their decisions uh, in the process will guide how many hours I spend um, on this matter. It's up to them um, how much I put into it. It's up to them to tell me to stop. Um, It's up to them to tell me to full steam ahead. I also inform them that it really depends on how the other side plays as well. If the other side is super litigious, super aggressive, and you advise me not to roll over and to fight back, of course, that's going to be costing more money. And one of the um, big drivers of increase in cost, of course, is how many hours your client calls you, um, not for just advice, but for therapy. And, you know, my hourly rate is much higher than a therapist, and I'm also not qualified as a therapist. Um, But sometimes clients want to talk to the lawyer um, to receive some emotional guidance. Um, Again, uh, the more you call me for emotional therapy, the higher the bill will be. So from the get-go, I did inform um, the client of that, that it really is just hourly. And um, you may want to think about when you're feeling really emotional, whether uh, you want to call me to uh, talk you off the ledge for three hours um, or whether you want to call a friend first. And so for you, Daniela, like it sounds like Lolita's very intentional about setting expectations um, and making sure people know on the front end exactly what they're getting into, not just in terms of your expectations of how we're going to work together, but also what this investment is going to be. So on the client side, right, you're going through a separation, probably not something you anticipated, were hoping for was going to happen. And now you have to pay for this to happen and you're hearing it could be, you know, at a range of things based on a, a, a number of different factors. What was your initial reaction to that? How did you receive that as a client sort of getting this information of like, this is going to cost, I can't give you exact cost, but here's how we can assess those different factors. Yeah, so Lolita was extremely upfront with her cost model and um, I just... I just took that on as that this is just the reality of my life for however long it takes to resolve this situation. And I, I appreciated her being upfront with cost because then I could kind of build a roadmap in my head of how to approach this. Um, for myself on the client side, to Lolita's point, I think that sometimes clients, especially in a family law matter where emotions run really high, they may lean on their, their lawyer for emotional support. Uh, very quickly on in our case, I tried very hard to always exercise separating my emotions from what was most important for the outcome. So when I would uh, reach out to Lolita, I would just focus on what the goal was for that day, that week, or that month, whatever it may be. And um, and that kept me more in line with with the cost model. And when things got a little bit more unpredictable, Lolita would press the stop button and let me know if costs were going to increase or if this was going to take more time so that I was I was aware of what I was saying yes to. Yeah. And I think sometimes we get uncomfortable about having to have a new conversation about costs. So, L- L- sorry, Lolita, how did you go through that process when it's like, hey, it looks like we have a new curve. This is going to be more expensive. What are the ways that you sort of processed that and communicated that with Daniela? Well, I gave her a choice. So, um, I told her um, this is a new curveball that has arisen that we didn't plan for. Um, 
-hmm. when ultimately uh, your goal is peace. Um, here's how we can achieve that. Uh, one of the ways would be to roll over, which will be will cost the least, right? Um, if you want to do that, um, we can do that. We can we can just um, not fight this particular issue that uh, has arisen. Um, or ultimately, if you feel that that will not give you peace and you cannot live with yourself and that it's worth fighting for, um, then yes, then I expect that this particular issue will take X amount of hours. I can't predict specifically how many hours it will take. Again, it depends on a number of factors. Um, but again, I just gave her a choice as to whether she would like to fight that issue um, or whether she uh, would like to um, settle that particular issue the way that the other side had proposed. And Daniela, did you ever find yourself deciding that you were going to or not going to fight something based on sort of guidance that you got around what the roadmap would be, the time, the expense? Like, as a client who now has the ball back in your hand about what decision you're going to make, how did some of those things impact the choices that you made as a client working alongside your attorney? I think uh, in my case, I always came back to what, what I wanted at the end of this experience and could I live with myself with the outcome? Would I be unhappy or satisfied? And ultimately, would I feel like my life regained peace? Uh, so I wasn't afraid to pursue anything, even based on cost, if it came back to that foundation for myself. Because even if something was like, expensive and I had to pay for it or find ways to pay for it, um, the ultimate goal for me was to, am I, will I be able to live with myself with these decisions and what's worth fighting over and what's worth not fighting over? And that really was what motivated me. And then the cost became an, a non-issue. It really was what's internally most peaceful for me. I love that. Um, one other thing that I've heard is, you know, Lolita, you gave Daniela a lot of options to make decisions. And we know that sometimes clients come to us expecting us to take care of it, to figure it out. Um, I'm not sure if that was your expectation when you first entered into this process of like, when I go to an attorney, they just go behind their attorney curtain and like make it work or what um, your initial expectations were. And if the fact that she gave you these options to make choices made you think more or less of the services that you were receiving. I actually did have that misconception. Uh, I was obviously under a lot of stress when this was developing. And when I first engaged with, with Lolita, I kind of took on the assumption, like when you go into a doctor's office, you just tell them your problem you get a prescription, it's taken care of. I really thought that that's kind of how it would roll out, but I realized very much that I had to be my own advocate. I had to provide her with all the information she was seeking. She's not a mind reader. And um, she was then able to start presenting different options for me of how I could get to that eventual finish line. Wonderful. We have about six minutes left, so I'm not sure if there are any potential questions that people might have in the audience around designing a client-centered law firm. So I definitely want to make space for that. If people have questions, I have more myself, but I think this is a great opportunity for you all to talk to someone who's been a client to, to find that out. Yeah. Just one second, she's going to bring a mic. Thanks. So um, I guess one of the things that we find, well, I, I love your approach and just kind of being really empathetic and feeling like you're on the same team together and working that and being really transparent about your processes and what they can expect. And I also agree that managing expectations right from the beginning is paramount to creating a successful client experience. Um, one of the things that I see a lot is how do you maintain that throughout the entire client journey with all of your clients when you're balancing 40 cases, 50 cases, 50 different people who have that amount of problems. You're in one trial the next day, a mediation the next day, and you've got all these clients with all these different needs. Do you find that capping the number of cases that you take or bringing on additional help or having a super streamlined process or calling all of your clients who aren't in trial that week just to make sure they're okay before you go to trial? I mean, what are you doing process-wise to help maintain that so that you don't have people getting mad as you balance? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, and yes, I have to cap the amount of clients that I can take. Um, the other option, of course, would be to um, expand. I'm a solo pr practitioner to expand and looking to, and I am looking into uh, um, 
uh, a junior associate so that I can have a little bit more help. Um, but uh, time management really is uh, having a cap on how many clients I can take. Um, and additionally, um, you know, slotting in uh, times for interviews or times that we're going to talk. If somebody calls me and they have an emergency, I mean, obviously, if I'm in trial, I cannot do that. And so what I tell my clients right away is, look, I'm in trial and I'm prepping for trial. Um, I will be unavailable for three weeks. I know that that's really difficult for you to hear or something may arise. But when it's your time and it's your trial, I will be fully devoted to you. So I really um, ask them to respect that. And if they don't respect that, then it's not going to work. I'm a solo practitioner. They need to understand that from the beginning. Um, so there is times that I go dark um, uh, as a result of being in trial. And to the other point um, is that, yes, I, I am exhausted too. And uh, some of, one of the things that we've been talking about here at, at this conference is, you know, assistance with uh, AI or assistance with management, um, calendar management. And um, I definitely need to use more of that. I love that. And I want it because I know Lalisa has an autoresponder that will let you know that she's in trial. And so I know that there are different ways that she's like leveraged and uses different pieces of technology to amplify the communication that she's already creating. Um, but I would curious from you, Daniela, as like one of her clients. And I know that she delivers and shows up this way with all of her clients. That's just like part of how she is. Did you ever feel like, where's my attorney? I'm not getting a good service. Uh, maybe just talk with us about what it was, if you ever felt like you were less of a priority because she had set these expectations around time and when she would be able to speak with you and work on your matter. Uh, that's exactly right. Lolita would give me forewarning if she was going to be unavailable. So I did try to respect that boundary. There were instances where something may have, may felt, may have felt more important that she needed to know about. And I would cross that boundary and let her know if she didn't respond, then I knew that maybe I don't even have to worry about it. And as uh, my matter developed, um, I learned a lot more about just like letting things go and knowing that Lolita was still keeping an eye on my case. And when she would reconnect with me, she was fully devoted. She was absolutely caught up to speed. It's not like I had to bring her back up to speed. It was like she just switched from one case to the other and was right back in it. I see a hand coming with the mic. While she's getting there, I love that. I'm like a, a parent. And so you learn about being present when you are like in the moment with that client. And so it sounds like there was a level of presence that you have when you're working on a matter and people know you'll get back to it. You haven't forgotten about them. You're right on the money once you start working and engaging again. Um, I have a question. I'd love to hear from Daniela. Um, you've spoken about advocacy uh, for yourself. Uh, through the process. And I'm curious what you would recommend to all the lawyers and legal professionals in the room when they start to engage with a client or to bring somebody on board, how to sort of set them up to know where that limitation exists and any lessons learned that you had through your journey around that, that advocacy for your own self and your own family. Yeah, I, I think that advocating for myself was a really strong motivator. I felt very capable of advocating for myself and providing Lolita with information I thought was important. Um, I think from the uh, attorney perspective, I think it might be a good idea to just interview your client just, you know, outside of whatever matter they're facing. Find out what they do for work, what's important in their lives, what hobbies they have, what skills they have, and ask them, like, do you want to be a part of this process and actually assist me with it? Um, I felt very comfortable writing, you know, taking first steps at my affidavits, which Lolita would review. And uh, she, she trusted me. And um, that made me feel very empowered and part of the, the solution. And I felt um, respected in it as well. Wonderful. Well, what does the last, oh, I have 30 seconds. Otherwise, well, maybe they can hang out. I don't want to say that you can, but maybe she'll follow up. In these last 25 seconds, um, what is a key takeaway for anyone out here who is looking to figure out how to design a more client-centered law practice? What's one nugget, one takeaway that you hope they would leave this conversation with? Well, I think it, it comes back to uh, Dindella and I actually discussed this um, beforehand for, for her, what, what's important for her. And for her, it was to achieve inner peace and uh, achieve peace in her um, relationship with, um, in, in her family now that it had broken up. 
Um, so I'd always bring it back to how do we get you to that, your initial goal? I have to agree. And that's exactly what we uh, focused on. Wonderful. Well, if you could give a round of applause to both Lolita and Daniela for being willing to share their experience here. And I would encourage you to think about with intentionality how you want your clients to experience your law practice and know that there are a lot of tools um, at your disposal to help you do that.